my screen. So yeah, it's 10 o'clock. Um, I want to welcome everybody as you're coming in. I'm Eric Engel. I'm president of CCTE. And welcome to this Arts Ed webinar from the special interest group at CCTE. Just a note that this webinar will be recorded and it will also be available on the CCTE YouTube channel um, so that you or your students can view it again. And I'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves as they come to the screen. So without further ado, um, let's get started. Fantastic. So I will start. My name is Nadia Conway and I am at UC Riverside. Um, I used art a lot in my elementary classroom, um, incorporating art Fridays. So I would make a connection between whatever it is we were working on in social studies or science and have art Fridays. Um, I also every year would have a dance unit um, and there are hundreds of now probably 30 year olds who know the Lion King dance. You, if, you, if you play the Lion King dance, I guarantee you they're gonna start moving. Um, but I, I am also, I was talking earlier, I am the daughter of a Filipino American artist who is also on the call today. So she's in Arizona, my parents are in Arizona. So hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Maureen Riley Lormer. I'm a professor at California Lutheran University. Uh, I teach pre-service uh, credential students as well as um, students who have obtained their credential and are working toward their master's degree. And I also work with undergrads who are working on their bachelor's degree who are taking a visual art and ed uh, class. Welcome. And I am Jody Moody. I am currently at Loyola Marymount University as an academic program director, as well as a TPA coordinator and a visual arts methods teacher. I am a former elementary and middle school art teacher, as well as I taught second and third grade. But I have to tell you, my heart's in the arts. And I have been so enjoying working with Eric and others um, as I'm chairing the SIG group for the CCTE. And with that, Eric, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Uh, I'm Eric Engel, as I said, I'm president of CCTE. I'm also chair of the Department of Teacher Education at Cal State East Bay. Um, my background is in both theater and visual art. Um, currently, I am really excited because I'm teaching theater methods in the very first theater credential program in the state of California in over 40 years. So I have been enjoying that immensely for the Thank next you. Uh, theater, credential theater teachers in the state of California. Thank you so much, Eric. All right. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and jump into our presentation today. And Maureen. So what is anti-racist teaching in arts education? Melanie Buffington, uh, and by the way, she has written two articles, one entitled Whiteness Is, and the other one entitled Power Play. And um, ultimately what she uncovered through her literature review document analysis and narrative inquiry is that we have systems in education that perpetuate whiteness. And she said the way to shift that, to change those systems is to begin to break down um, the choices. And so this quote I think sticks out quite strongly for me. She says, you need to recognize you have the power and that you have a choice to use your power to continue to promote whiteness in education or decenter whiteness while working for a more equitable future. And there are several ways to go about doing that. One is to understand that whiteness is a force in education. So we need to make different choices. Uh, for example, something as simple as choosing to select artwork from um, black 
uh, artists, uh, as opposed to the traditional Western European canon, uh, when you are working and providing uh, artwork for students to uh, examine and model. Um, and through the lesson today, you're gonna see a great artist uh, that is in a perfect example of how you can go about doing that. Another way is to give students choices rather than just directing them into a specific technique or uh, a specific um, art design, uh, talking it through and modeling and having students really, really discuss their different options is really, really important. Um, drawing from critical race uh, methodology, we can build upon uh, different resources uh, to augment and break down these systems of structural racism within art education. Excellent. Thank you, Maureen. And speaking of that, I have a resource for y'all. Um, this is a podcast called UDL in 15 minutes. And I was on a flight recently from Texas coming home and I was binge listening to all of Dr. Louis Lord Nelson's UDL in 15 minutes. And I came across this particular podcast and it was an art, an AP art history teacher named Timory. And they started with the idea of allowing, again, back to decentering whiteness, with allowing students to choose from contemporary to them artwork and begin to build on more contemporary, which will allow them to be more engaged in the work. So looking at artists like our artwork today is a great place to begin. Instead of starting, like Maureen said, in the Western canon. And so I highly recommend UDL in 15 minutes. It's a great quick 15 minutes on your way to something, to the post office or whatnot, plug this in. She's phenomenal and specifically podcast 65. And with that, Maureen's gonna talk a little bit about our artist. So Kira Walker is an amazing artist. She began as a painter and became very, very accomplished. But what she's most known for are her silhouettes. And her silhouettes really, really are intended to startle and disturb uh, the public because she wants to raise awareness and bring um, a much important and needed attention to uh, racism and issues. So she juxtaposes uh, different images. Um, some, and I'll, I'll caution you for those of you working with the younger kids, some are very sexually explicit, others are very, very disturbing in their nature. And she intended it that way. And when you go to her exhibits, they often put signs on the outsides of her exhibits to uh, warn viewers that uh, for young children, this could be uh, a little bit uh, uncomfortable. But I don't want you to steer away from Kara Walker's work. I want you to figure out a way um, through your creative um, thinking and what your learning goals are uh, to use her work because she's a phenomenal artist with an important message for all of us to pay attention to. Um, she tells stories through her silhouettes. And I think that can be a really, really exciting model and a topic for conversation within your classroom. For our lesson, uh, we've targeted third grade and we're going to be blending art and science. Yes, so as a former third grade teacher, I was always looking for opportunities to pull in my content areas with the visual and performing arts. So this is one place where we can integrate the arts and not only science, but we're also gonna to push to EL and English language as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about her use of narratives. And so with that, Nadia is gonna talk a little bit about standard alignment. Yes, so this is the part where we really want to encourage um, educators 
to really think about how you can incorporate arts with the current content or the curriculum that you are currently using. And as you can see here, we were able to identify a few um, standards that will connect with the um, activity that we are about to share with you. So the first one is the visual and performing arts standard, um, which is one that we selected. There were, there were a few, but we narrowed it down to one. Um, and then the ELA standard for literacy is writing narratives to develop real or imagined experiences or events using effective technique, descriptive details, and clear event and sequences. We also identified ELD standards. And I'm going to um, point out which one specifically um, as we get later on in the activity and how that does connect and how you can really um, use this art activity to develop those ELD standards with your English language learners. And then also um, connecting this to the NGSS science standards. And as I had mentioned earlier, I really, I, I, every Friday we would have an art activity that connected to either the social studies or science unit. And it's just a one other way to reinforce the content that you are teaching um, your students. And with that, Nadia is going to elaborate a little bit further about creating these measurable objectives with the learning goal and objective and assessment. So one of the other things that we look at as educators when we're, we're um, lesson planning is what is it at the end of this activity in this lesson um, will students be doing to demonstrate their understanding or mastery of the learning goals that we are setting forth. And so it's really important also to think about how are the students going to demonstrate that understanding of that science standard, of that literacy standard, of that ELD standard. And as you can see, we're incorporating the visual and performing art standards as well. Um, and so coming up with that objective, and then really thinking closely and about what we are expecting and asking students to do and making that known to our students that this is our target um, and this is what you're going to do to demonstrate your understanding so that students understand um, what those expectations are. So for our learning objective today, it's students will create a silhouette and narrative description of a biome. And this arts integrated learning experience blends science, art and writing and for the assessment, students will share a silhouette and narrative description of a biome, evidence of arts integration, understanding of biome, and attention to all standards is clear. Excellent. And with that, Maureen's going to talk about integration. So the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts is really um, the go-to for our understanding of a solid definition of arts integration. And what I want you to do is to take a minute to just look at that and I will read it aloud. Arts integration is an approach to teaching in which students construct and demonstrate understanding through an art form. Students engage in creative process which connects an art form with another subject area and meets evolving objectives in both. Nadia alluded to that when she shared our objective for this uh, activity. But what I want you to hold on to and um, save is this definition because it really, really speaks uh, to the importance of placing the arts as a very solid first approach rather than a subservient to some other um, slipshot of a combination of uh, curricular areas. Often what we see when we go into classrooms to observe lessons is a really, really great science or history social studies lesson with just a snippet of art thrown in, um, but it really doesn't follow this definition of really having students construct and demonstrate their understanding through an art form. So it's very, very important that we provide equal access through um, art vocabulary 
through art materials, techniques, and tools uh, that are really, really pretty explicit. And with that, we're going to jump into some of the things you might need for this art lesson. So Nadia, can you just walk through this real quick with us? Yes. Yes. Um, so for the materials list, your students will need an exemplar. And, uh, you know, examples are always fantastic. White drawing paper. So two pieces, scissors, glue, pencil, a black marker. And um, for the upper grades, it's optional to have black paper so that students can trace their animal on the black paper and cut it out. And um, you'll see how this could be an option for those students. Thank you, Nadia. So now I'm gonna take you through just a little bit of what you could be doing in your third grade biome science portion. So we're gonna kind of start in science here and we're gonna have kids think contextually. Again, a really important thing around culturally responsive teaching is, is in context. So asking kids animals that live near them. So I wanna start them thinking about their animals and as we have seen recently, oh my goodness, we saw a bear in Oakley and a bear in Duarte, which are rather suburban areas. So some kids might pop up with, you know, yeah, Miss Moody, I saw a bear in my backyard or I saw a raccoon or a possum. So those are some ways to just begin to generate also a vocabulary list. So that's something really important we wanna start with. Then I'm gonna slide into, all right, let's talk about different types of biomes where these animals can live. So I've got my animal and now I've got my biome and now I'm gonna start unpacking my vocabulary because I'm also gonna start pivoting them towards writing up a little story about them and their biome. So I might wanna start unpacking word wall ideas or word bank ideas. Words like alpine, tundra, marine, rainforest. And then I'm gonna have them select their favorite animal in a particular biome that they wanna pick. So I might say a coyote that lives in the desert. So now I'm starting to connect my animal and the biome that would live in it. And so for my lesson today, I picked the mountain goat. And I'm gonna start thinking about, okay, what lives in the alpine biome? So I have my mountain goats, I have rocky, craggy surfaces. I might have some little shrub flowers, things that don't go very big, but rather small. So I'm starting to, to um, front load kids with that vocabulary as I'm building my exemplar. Now I'm gonna move into the EL portion. Now that I've got them thinking about their animal, their biome and the vocabulary, now I'm gonna have them start writing a little narrative. And so I'm going to do this as an exemplar. So you can kind of read mine, but also while I'm reading mine aloud to the kids, I might be underlining key descriptive words, words like pointy, words like, um, and action words like clicking, stomping, and stopped. So those are words I might start underlining and putting that in a word bank because I really want to, in third grade, my one of my big goals for writing was to get them to be more descriptive. So again, I'm going to maybe even give them a chart of other descriptive words that they could use. Now I'm going to have them tell their story, right? I'm going to have them maybe do this out loud and contextualize it around their story. And I'm going to have them build this. And these are some prompting things that you can have kids do. And with that, let you read that through. Now is a chance for academic language where Nadia is gonna jump in. Yes, so again, with your lesson planning, really thinking about those opportunities for students to engage and describe and analyze um, the content that you are presenting to them. So, um, this is when you can have your, your students turn and talk to their partners, um, talk about the biomes and the animals. Um, and and this, I, this is my thought bubble here as, as, our, as educators. So really think closely about how will students be using the vocabulary, discourse, syntax, and language functions, such as describe and analyze throughout the lesson. And then this is also an opportunity to include those planned supports. You know, as, as Jody said, maybe you have a word wall or a word bank. Perhaps some students may need some sentence starters. 
um, that could be available. Um, and then if you're wanting students to describe or analyze, how can you guide them with the questions that you're presenting and the examples and the modeling that you give um, to really get them to, to have some um, robust discussions um, during these um, opportunities throughout the lesson. And I think the next slide, yes. Okay, so this is the ELD um, standard. And so when you're planning for your English language learners, really thinking about where they fall on the proficiency, proficiency level continuum and creating those supports for students who are in the emerging, expanding, or the bridging categories. And this ELD standard corresponds to the literacy standard that we selected. And then um, if you're just looking at the presenting or the supporting opinions, like really thinking closely and guiding your students to um, achieve these uh, learning objectives or these standards for your English language learners. Now, Maureen, you can start talking about the amazing Kara Walker. So as I mentioned, she at age 24, um, really shook up the art world with her um, silhouettes. Uh, and it really prompted people to start thinking uh, in new ways and have a deeper understanding of um, the impact uh, of, of slavery. Um, her work is still widely regarded. Um, she really spends time thinking about the ways that she can insert um, whimsical uh, and, and thought provoking uh, ways to um, create her silhouettes uh, that prompt discussion and thought about history, about the past, about the present, uh, and about the future. And with that, we're going to start jumping into this is one piece that she has done. Um, do you have any more, Maureen, you want to elaborate on this work? Um, no, I, I think it would be important if I was using this with my students to have them uh, do a 60 second look and uh, talk about what they noticed. Um, what do you notice in terms of the lines, the shapes, the colors, the textures? Um, um, and ask them what questions they have so that they can really take some time to unpack what they're noticing and how this artist went about creating uh, this work. So now I would wanna take the kids through an exemplar. So we've seen a master silhouette artist at work. We saw her use of scissors and jagged forms. Now I want to take that and I want to think about that for my third graders. So contingent on their developmental, you know, where they are in art, I might have them go ahead and sketch out their biome animal, or I might have an image library where they can trace it. It all depends on where they are developmentally. I would have them trace an outline with pencil and then go back over it with a black marker. That's just one way to approach this. Now, again, depending on the level of the kid, to either bubble cut around the goat, again, for younger children, I'm thinking, I'm like dropping this way back. If you wanted to take this into a, maybe a first or a second grade level, a bubble cut is an easy way with the help of an adult or having my third graders go ahead and start practicing. Remember those jagged lines we saw from Kara Walker? Wow, that took a, and they're gonna see firsthand how hard it is to cut out these really small intricate levels. So maybe again, having them teaching them to go around it might be really helpful here so they don't get frustrated. And now they're going to cut it out and glue it onto their white paper. Now, I also added in some elements of my biome by the use of a zigzag line by creating the illusion of rocks. So I want them to show them that the goat is contextual, meaning it has a little home. Here's this in the foreground. It's standing on these jagged rocks, and I can just simply do that with a black marker. Now, I want to up this if I wanted to increase the level of sophistication. I can take this into an upper elementary or even a middle school level and have them do the entire thing 
on black paper where they would draw their image with a pencil or in, when I taught middle school, I would use a white um, crayon and have them um, do the image there and then freehand cut those rocks. So that'd be a really nice challenge for our middle school kiddos. And now here's an actual exemplar that came with one of the lesson plans that we found. And this one is of a goat. And they went ahead and they went around the goat with some blue crayon on top of the black paper. And then they went with the white crayon back over it. So this is just another iteration or way to do it with um, silhouettes in their biome. And with that, I'm gonna have Maureen talk about reflecting. Okay, so at the end of every lesson, after the students have completed their work, it's very, very, very critical to have that reflection piece um, so that they can go back and um, almost a like a self-assessment and it really taps into our learning objective and the assessment that we had shared. And one of the ways to do that is, again, to uh, look at a gallery walk. You, you can flip it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, to have a gallery walk and uh, talk about what do you notice and what questions do you have? We can have them point out specifically the lines and the shapes that they used and the way that they used them and ask the question, what do you think your viewers are going to um, understand from this um, piece of artwork? So that gives them an opportunity to double check uh, whether what they had created really speaks to what they had initially intended. Um, similar to what Carol Walker uh, had intended. She wanted to shake up and startle uh, her viewers, and maybe your students would like to do the same. Okay, so what I did is I compiled all of these resources um, in a flyer, and I'm going to put this in the chat box for you. So we have created some links to a few of the resources that we've mentioned here in this um, presentation. Um, I also have, um, when Eric begins speaking, there's links to the handouts that he has as well on the second page. Um, so this is just a beginning repository for you to start um, exploring some of the different ways that you can um, incorporate art in your in, in your classes. Um, on the second page, we have the art standards and the arts framework, and also there's a mobile app that you can download onto your smartphones. Um, so this is just the beginning. I mean, there are definitely a lot more resources here, but we really wanted to um, give you something to to start with. Was there anything else that you wanted to, we have some um, really great links to um, Kara Walker's work. Um, there's a video as well. Um, there's the, the anti-racist art teachers websites are just fantastic and phenomenal for getting started. And I included one link to um, the lesson plans um, on the updated version. The picture that I have here is, is a version that we had a couple days ago. So if you use the link um, that I put in the chat box, um, please um, feel free. I'm actually gonna put my uh, email in here as well in case you have any problems accessing. Um, so you can let me know that as well. And I, read Bettina's Love's book over the weekend, which is, by the way, highly recommend, quick read. And when I caught this site, um, when she talks about art, I just stopped and I had to drop it into our presentation because I was so excited to hear her as she connects abolitionist teaching and the arts. I was so excited. It was like she validated our entire webinar. Thank you, Dr. Love. <laughs> And so with that, we're going to start talking. Can I add just one more thing before we move on? 
the Wait. last link uh, for Kara Walker or Subtle Tea uh, uh, or the Marvelous Sugar Baby, mm -hmm. it tells the story of something that Kara Walker took on. And I think this could be inspirational for your students when they feel like they've hit a wall and they don't know what they're going to do. Because Kara Walker, as I said, was a very accomplished uh, painter and she was very accomplished at the silhouettes, but she never created a sculpture. And she was given the opportunity to create a massive sugar sculpture in an old factory that had sugar factory that had closed down. So it gave her an opportunity to send a very, very powerful message. And it turned out to be one of her most amazing uh, accomplishments as well. Um, so when you read that article, you can learn all about that experience. And there were numerous people that came to visit that sugar sculpture. Uh, and it was really, really a powerful learning experience. And I think that sends a message to young students that you can take on challenges that you feel are beyond your scope and ability uh, and, and meet those challenges and um, be very, very successful. Thank you, Maureen. So with that, and again, please check out these links. They are phenomenal and highly recommended. Um, I actually taught this Norman Walkrell for freedom for an SEL for special needs students or students with um, disability. Sorry, I can't check my language. Um, and it was an excellent, excellent lesson plan series. It does go through some really good images and really motivates kids to think about their social emotional learning. So highly recommend that as well. Um, with that, we're going to have Eric jump in and start talking standards. Thank you for that. Um, so some of you may know this and some of you may not know this, but um, California has a new set of art standards. And perhaps the biggest news to take away from it is the VAPA standards are gone away. We no longer have VAPA standards. We have California art standards. And you'll see the reason for that is because we now have five content areas. In addition to dance, music, theater, and visual arts, media arts has been added as one of the important new art standards. And when we were working on the standards in Sacramento, we decided along with the CDE that we should get rid of VAPA because it was not inclusive of media arts. So we now have the California art standards. Um, and you should uh, be aware that the California art standards uh, are based on the national core art standards. Um, our task in Sacramento when we rewrote the standards was to uh, take the national core art standards and revise them in a California context, which is what we did. And I think it's a good set of standards. I just wanna point out the philosophical goals uh, philosophical foundations and the lifelong goals that underpin the standards that the arts serve as communication, as creative personal realization, as culture, history, and connectors, as a means to well being, community engagement, and as a profession. Uh, next slide, please. So, here is just a little bit more about media arts. I will let you read that. It is now the fifth art form. There is no, by the way, media arts credential. So media arts is a very interdisciplinary art tying together all the things that we, we do. You could make the argument that in this webinar, we are practicing media arts by the fact that we're taking all of our arts and putting them into a video and communicating them over the net. So um, this is a really wonderful and exciting, I think, area for us to consider is how media helps us to really integrate the arts with each other and how to bring in those integrative elements. So that you may notice that there are just 
four artistic processes. All of the all of the content areas share four artistic processes: creating, performing, presenting, or producing, responding, or connecting. And you will see there that under the four artistic processes, there are anchor standards. For example, under create, generate, and conceptualize artistic ideas and work. Organize and develop artistic ideas and work. Refine and complete artistic work. These anchor standards are the same in all five arts disciplines. So it is really important to realize that these are process standards. These are standards where we are teaching the artistic processes. Nowhere in these standards will you, for example, find that you're gonna teach the elements of art at first grade and the principles design at fourth grade in visual arts. Um, that you're gonna teach this bit of cultural history in theater in, in, in middle school. And that's because we recognize and the writers of the national standards recognize that it is the processes that are important that we need to teach and that when we use things like the elements of art principles of design what that really means is that those get introduced and used and reused and built upon and expanded upon throughout the entire academic life of a student so this is the real change creating performing presenting producing responding and connecting next slide Also within the standards, under each of the shared artistic processes, um, there are enduring understandings and there are essential questions. These enduring understandings and essential questions are really put into the standards so that you as the teacher can help to guide the student inquiry. And then there are the process components the verbs that actually operationalize the standards. We're going to talk about them in just a minute. And then you will see that if you look into the performance standards, um, they are discipline specific and they show what students can do by the end of a grade or course. So for PK, pre-kindergarten through grade eight, there are grade specific standards under each of the artistic processes that should be, should be, ideally would be taught in those grade levels. However, for high school, it's a little bit different. For high school, there are three levels of standards, proficient, accomplished, and advanced. Proficient standards for high school are the standards that someone should be teaching for the student who is taking one studio arts class one theater class, one dance class. Accomplished standards are the standards that more or less would be for students who are in a second year high school art class, arts class. And advanced standards are for those students who would be in multiple years of arts classes who may have experience with the arts outside of and in addition to their high school experience. So that's how the standards are set up. Uh, next slide, please. So this just shows you in chart that um, the artistic processes are the same, the anchor standards are the same, the essential questions, the enduring understandings, and the process components are specific to each uh, content area. Next slide. Eric, I have a question in the chat box about sure. the cornerstone tasks. Um, the cornerstone tasks are in the national standards. Um, they are not so much in the California standards. Um, and the California standards just recently got published. I just received my copy in the mail yesterday, but it is also online. Um, now, this is the exciting stuff for me about the standards. 
it is the process verbs that we use. Um, so you see in this chart that I've divided into the four areas, creating, performing, responding, connecting. And down there in purple are the process verbs that are used under each of these various standard areas. Um, and if you look at these wonderful, rich verbs that are in the processes, that is when, when I'm teaching my students, my pre-service students, this is where I tell them to find their lesson objective verbs. Students will imagine, students will investigate, students will integrate, students will relate, that this for me is the heart of how we actualize the standards in our practice. That we go back and as we put our lessons together, we're using these verbs to write our lesson objectives and that these then build upon our, um, our assessments. Uh, so I think that this is a really great way to get into the standards. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, can I pop in for two seconds as an ed TPA visual arts person? Because I have taught, um, I've helped candidates do their ed TPA and visual arts. But, um, and specifically, we would call those for the ed TPA a language function. And they have to call it out. And they have to devise a support. So imagine, imagine, using the word imagine, and building supports around imagining. I think it's a really great opportunity to build support. So sorry, the NTPA coordinator popped in for a moment. No, that, that's great is because the standards are obviously key to success in teaching and in the NTPA. Um, and they really do all relate and integrate with each other. Um, so before I go into doing, um, to getting into theater, that was a romp, a 12 minute romp through the standards. And I just want to see if there's any questions that you have. You could pop, pop them in the chat. You can just popcorn them up. Um, and um, just one thing before we lose this slide. Well, all right. Um, so any questions about the standards or anything um, as regards to that? By the way, when you get um, the, the slide, all of the handouts that you saw earlier, again, are tied to that, um, that link. So do we have any questions, um, thoughts, comments about the standards? Nothing's coming up in the chat box right now, but I will still, if, if things do, I will definitely add that to our conversation. But so far, no. OK. All right, then let's lose the slideshow. All right, so we're gonna um, we're gonna do some theater now, um, and this is going to be obviously a challenge um, with uh, this many people on Zoom. As I put this together, I just want you to be aware that I put this together with the assumption that we are moving back towards face-to-face -face classrooms. Um, and that therefore I'm making what minor concessions to Zoom, um, but I am making the concessions that we need to, to do this well. So the first thing I would like for you to do is just wherever you are, however you can, is just stretch. You know, just whatever you're comfortable with, Stretch, get the blood flowing. You can stand up if you want to. Um, but just do a little bit of stretching here so that we, oh, yes, it feels good. We've been sitting in Zoom, not just for the last hour, but for the last year and a half. And it's nice to stretch and move around. Oh, shoulders and neck, especially as we've been staring at screens. Okay. That's great. 
All right, so we're going to do a few warm ups. Now, you will see that when I have put together um, the handout, most of the work that we're going to be looking at is theater that has relevance to social justice. And the two, pra the two practices that I'm most going to be focusing on today are uh, practices from theater of the oppressed. If you're not familiar with theater of oppressed, it was developed by Augusto Balal, um, a Brazilian theater maker. Um, obviously, uh, as you might guess, he was very much influenced by his fellow Brazilian Paulo Freire and, and pedagogy of the oppressed. And we're also going to be looking at a form of theater called playback theater, which is, has some therapeutic uses as well as social justice uses. Um, and all of those resources are in the handout that Nadia uh, pointed out earlier. So we need to first of all get our creativity flowing. Um, what I'm going to do, let me explain what I'm going to do. In just a minute, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms with just one other person. So there'll be two people in a breakout room. And you are going to play a little bit of game that is called, what are you doing? Okay. Now, um, Jody, can I get you to model this game for me, with me? You bet. All right, the way that this game works is I'm going to start miming an activity. Um, say I'm brushing my teeth. And Jody is going to ask me, what are you doing? All right, Eric, what are you doing? I'm going to say anything except brushing my teeth. So I might say, Oh, I'm uh, mowing the lawn. Jody starts mowing the lawn. I stop brushing my teeth and I say, Jody, what are you doing? I am combing my hair. Something I've never done in my life. <laughs> and you stop, Jody, and you ask me, Eric, what are you doing? I'm walking the dog. Jody, what are you doing? I am eating a pizza. Eric, what are you doing? I, uh, I'm planting flowers. And so that goes on and on and on. It's a very fast activity. There's no right way to do it. There's no wrong way to do it. Um, and it's just a way to get our thoughts flowing, to get some creativity going. So I'm going to put you into breakout rooms, um, and it's just going to be um, two, maybe three people. Um, so, I, and I'm going to give you about 90 seconds or so to do it. So that means that um, that means that when when you're in there, um, you'll get the the minute warning that says the rooms will close, but keep going until the room closes. So there's the breakout rooms. Um, I'll stay here if you're in a question and let's just get, get our creative juices flowing.
I messed up. I need to go back to my breakout room. I was in 10. <laughs> okay. Um, I clicked the wrong button. It's all right. Let me. Sorry. Um, I, it's okay. If it's too much, it's okay. okay. Sorry. No problem. I was I was explaining the exercise. We I, I'm a teaching artist, and I actually do that exercise in my in my um, classes. So I love that exercise. Yeah, it's a great warm up. I just I really enjoy it. Okay, everybody should be coming back. Okay. <laughs> no, you all have many smiles on your faces after that. That's a good thing. Hey. Okay, let me. <laughs> um, any, uh, any, just unmute if you have any quick reactions, popcorn, any reactions to what that was like? It was fun. Good. Yeah, it was fun. It's difficult if you can't see the other person. <laughs> yes. So yes, it, it, it is better if you will be brave and turn on your cameras to, to go ahead and do that. And, um, and remember the breakout rooms are not recorded. So uh, Good. That's, that's not recorded. I would just say one thing, this is a wonderful exercise. Um, I've done it for a long, long time with all sorts of communities of students yeah. and age groups. Yes. And I would just give you one warning, maybe. I don't even know if it's a warning. I find that regardless of the age group, um, about three or four rotations into what are you doing, we often go through the gross phase um, picking my nose, scratching my whatever. Um, and you know what? I just let it happen because it goes through it. And once they've done it, they generally don't go back to it. Um, and you know, if your school is, 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 is very concerned about that, then just say, make the language appropriate. But, and adults are the worst, of course, by the way. Um, so next thing that I'd like to try to do here is something that's called a check-in. And this comes from Playback Theater. And the way that we're going to do the check-ins today, we're going to do them in several different ways. But the first check-in is um, I want to hear from anyone who, who volunteers, and I'll look for hands up. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you then to just Tell us how you're doing today, what you're thinking about, how you're feeling. Um, just a brief sort of check-in about who you are. So um, anyone volunteer to just come on screen and let me check in with them? I'm going to call on people I know that. Yeah, Carrie, can you can check ask me. Pedro raised his hand. Who Pedro. did? Pedro. Pedro. Pedro, thank you. Unmute yourself, Pedro. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hi, Pedro. Pedro. Hello. So what's how I'm doing, basically, I'm just trying to strategically carpet, uh, carpet. Uh, anyways, I'm trying to <laughs> strategically plan the rest of my week. I have an assignment. I have a paper due. So I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about what I'm going to have for later on for lunch. And then just, um, you know, make sure I take care of the task that's due first and then worry about the task that's due after. So, so Pedro, in all these tasks that you are putting together, um, how are you feeling about that? Are you nervous? Are you excited? Are you looking forward to it? Are you dreading it? I'm a little bit nervous. I don't want to use the word dread, but um, luckily I'm building myself time to allow an opportunity to do it. So that won't make it quite as dreadful. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pedro. So Patricia, I will get to you for our second check-in. Um, 
So here's what we're going to do. Um, you all heard Pedro's check-in. And what I'd like you to do is to physicalize how it is that Pedro is feeling. So he has expressed um, there's a lot to do, that there's a little bit of, of, of anxiety about it, but he feels pretty good about it. So just give him um, a frozen picture, a statue, as that reflects back the feeling that he's feeling through his big check-in, okay? And uh, when I say the words, let's watch, that's when you should give um, Pedro the, uh, the way that you're reflecting back. So let's watch. Take a minute, Pedro, look around the screen. Okay, go to neutral. So Pedro, did you see, um, did you see actions there that were uh, reflective of how you're feeling? Absolutely. Okay, good. Patricia, would you like to check in? Sure. Hello from New York City. Um, I woke up with a cold today. I'm finishing my semester, my first semester teaching this summer, and I have a lot to do, but I really wanted to come on and join you guys because I always have a good time. So I'm happy to be here, even though I have a cold, but you can't catch it because you're too far away. <laughs> so, so Patricia is happy to be here, feeling a little bit coldy, um, and still she has a lot to do. So. Again, we're gonna reflect back Patricia's check-in after I give the signal, which is the words, let's watch. Oh. Oh. Wow, a lot of good ones. <laughs> All right, and go to neutral. Okay, nice. So did you see things that resonated for you there, Patricia? Oh, yes. Uh, I saw Carrie first. She got a tissue out and then Kathy got a tissue out. Then other people, you know, showed that they weren't feeling well. So, yeah, that, very good. Thank you. <laughs> good, good. All right. So we're going to take this now to, to a, a, a next level. Um, and for this, I'm going to need one person to volunteer to check in. And then I'm gonna need four other volunteers who are willing to demonstrate the, the model for us. So I can see hands raised or I can't see everybody all at once. So it may take me a minute to check. So Carrie, are you volunteering to perform or check in? Either one, okay. So Carrie, you're a performer. Uh, Michelle. Checking in or being a performer? Whatever, whatever you're, I'm fine, whatever you want. So Carrie, Michelle um, are gonna be performers. Anyone else volunteering to be a performer? One, one more brave soul. All right, Angelica. So Angelica, Carrie, and Michelle are our performers. We'll do it with three. And um, can I have someone volunteer to do a check-in? Angel, can I, can I uh, voluntold you to do a check-in for us? Yes, of course. It's going to be very similar to Pedro's, though. <laughs> That's perfectly all right. All right, so we're going to do one other thing before we go forward with this, and this is one of our concessions to Zoom. Under the video settings in Zoom, if you would all click video settings, and then if you would go down and under settings, you'll have to scroll down a little bit, select hide non-video participants. and then you can close your settings. And that means that we're only going to see the people who have cameras on. 
And now I'm going to ask um, Michelle Carey um, Angelica and Angel and me to stay on and everyone else to turn off the camera. Just turn off your camera and then, all right. So the way that this works is that I'm gonna ask Angel about his check-in and then Carrie, you're going to do um, a fluid sculpture. This is called a fluid check-in. So you're going to do, you can talk, you can add words, um, you can add sounds and movement, um, reflecting one facet or one, one aspect of Angel's check-in. And then Angelica, carry 10, 15 seconds at the most and then freeze. Then Angelica, you're going to come in with your another facet of Angel's check-in at 10, 15 seconds max. And then Michelle, you will do yet another facet. And you stay frozen in, in whatever your ending is, all right? So Angel, how are you feeling today? So today I'm feeling pretty good, actually. Um, a little busy. I have quite a bit to do this week um, in preparation for the weekend. Um, I have an event planned for Saturday, so I'm trying to best organize my time to get all my assignments done before Saturday. But like I said, I woke up, it's nice and sunny outside, and I'm in a pretty good mood, so I'm confident that I'm going to get everything done. So is your event this weekend something fun and social, something you're really yes. looking forward to? Yes, definitely. Um, there's quite a few birthdays this summer, as well as quite a few college graduates um, from my wife's side of the family. So we're kind of having an event to kind of celebrate everybody's success. So do you have some anxiety then about getting assignments and everything done and ready on time? A little, but I've had um, pretty full schedules before, so I'm confident that it'll all get done in time. Okay. All right. Good. So um, it's going to be Carrie and then Angelica and then Michelle. And remember, there's no way to do this wrong. So um, let's watch. Go. That, got that, got that. Good. Next thing. Okay. Got that, got that, got that. Check. Next thing. Check. Okay. Email. Hold on. Oh, gosh. Okay, hold on. I'll be right there, okay? Hold on. Okay. Me? Yes. Aaron? Oh, sorry. Yes. All right. Gosh, I have so much to plan. Um, I know how to do this. I've done this before. This is not going to be a problem. And, um, oh, I can't believe... Oh thing I need to remember to turn this off because I get interrupted all the time and oh my gosh I totally forgot let it oh no I know how to do this good good so Anho um what did you see there was there any what did that resonate for you yes all very accurate actually um especially the flipping through the books or the planners of some sort I have my planner open right here right next to me and a notebook for notes. So that was very accurate. Um, I, I actually, I don't turn my phone off, but I will put it in my bedroom and let it charge and then come out to the living room and my desk and do my work here. So that's not a, distra a distraction. So they were all very accurate representations. So is there anything you would like to have seen that you didn't see? Um, no, actually, that is pretty much how I respond to overwhelming and stressful situations. I 
do my best not to panic or to freak out in any way, shape or form. It's more so like, all right, here's my to-do list. Here's my checklist, cross that off as I get it done and then just move on about my day to the next task. Okay, good. I, I would say one thing I would like to have seen was a little bit of excitement and anticipation about the party that's coming up this weekend. Is that you don't, the, 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 our actors don't have to do the same, but can do different facets of, of the check-in. So that was great, thank you. Uh, let's give them a big hand and let's turn on our cameras and come back. Great job, great job. All right, now um, one of the things that you will find in the handout is um, a sort of lengthy description of how to teach the basic skills of improvisation. Um, we're not going to go into that at this point. It, it's, it's, it's hard to do, I think, in the Zoom process, um, but um, why would we build improvisation skills in a classroom? One of the reasons is it's a really good um, basic skill that you can layer on a lot of other theater skills. Um, also, one of the key points in improvisation is the absolute trust in your scene partner or scene partner. Every, you have to, the golden rule of improv that I always teach my students is that always make your partner look good. You are responsible for the success of your partner and vice versa. And that's a great way to think about trust building and community in the class. And one of the ways that I start the improv um, exercise is that I ask people to, in groups to form an image of community. What is an image that represents community? Um, and you can talk about, well, I see a forest as an image of community because it's all connect, interconnected, you know, what's going on under the ground and the roots and the bugs and the animals and the plants and the trees. Um, we can get back into our biomes if we want. Um, there are other images of community, maybe it's a symphony orchestra. There really is no wrong, wrong, wrong answer here. So I'm gonna, we're gonna go back to breakout rooms. Then we're gonna put more people in each breakout room. We'll probably put five or six people in each breakout room. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to talk about images of community. What does community mean? And then using the, the little, our little screens, our Hollywood Square screens, create an image of community. One that you can bring back hopefully and share with us as a whole. So show us what's an image of community. Um, I will tell you, for those of you who may not know this about Zoom, there is no way to like get everybody lean to the right, um, simply because Zoom will put people in different orders on different screens. Some of you have mirroring turned on, some of you don't. So don't try to do things where everybody leans in the same direction. It ain't gonna happen on Zoom. Don't frustrate yourself, all right? So it has to be there for an image where you're in, in interaction with each other, but you're not trying to do anything too special. So I'll give you probably three minutes or so to discuss and talk about an image of community. And I don't see any questions, so. All right, so, and, you know, please, again, if you would participate, please turn on your cameras in the breakout room, and I will see you in about three minutes or so.
once I open the rooms. Oh, girl, I'm trying to. All right. Do I have uh, one brave group that is willing to share their image of community with us? Okay, Kathy. Kathy's group. Um, I assume you know who Kathy, who, who's in Kathy's group. If everyone would turn off their cameras then, except for Kathy's group, then we can see them a little bit better.
Whenever you're ready. Okay, um, because of the different orientation, visual orientation, we we gather together and we're making this symbol. So you ready? Um, so we're we're facing each other actually to make that. Am I making a heart? Oh. <laughs> So it's kind of a namaste to each other, okay. but a heart, <laughs> a caring community. Thank you. So one of the things that it is important to do, you can turn your cameras back. One of the things that it is important to do in an exercise like this with students is, is and, and Kathy did it naturally, I really appreciate that, is it not just what's the image, but what's your thinking behind the image? And, you know, as Kathy was describing the heart and also it was a namaste to each other, we get, we get a sense of, of what the students are thinking and how we're sharing with each other and what it is that, you know, that's really going on more deeply. A lot of these exercises are, are as much about interaction and talk and sharing as they're about the final exercise themselves. So we have, we're gonna do one more exercise. I'm gonna ask you to do this with the same group. Um, this is called image theater, and this comes directly from Bilal's work. Um, what I want you to do, first of all, in a group, is consider a social problem, consider um, the reality of where it is that you're working and what is not going well and what goes well and what doesn't go well. Uh, think about, you know, you can think about how schools were or during the pandemic, um, you can think about issues of racial justice and anti-racist teaching. Consider tough issues. And then create an image of the reality of that issue as you as a group see it today. Okay? So if... Um, taking the idea of schools during pandemic, maybe you're seeing um, alienation, not connection, um, people being silenced. Um, go ahead and create the image of the current reality of that situation. Then what I want you to do is to create an image of the projected reality that you want to see in the future as you work to solve this and change this reality. So what's the current reality and what's the future reality that you want to see? And if you have time, think about one other image, which is the image of transition, the image that gets you from the reality to the future reality that you want to see. Now, there should be a lot of discussion about this. There should be among your group a thoughtful discussion about here's what the current reality is and here's how we embody it. That becomes important that you put it into the body. Here's the future that we want to see as this resolves and improves. And again, you really want to embody that and put it in the body. And then What's the physical transition? How do we get from where we are to where we want to be? Does that make sense? Any questions? And I'm going to give you, again, this is very short. I'm going to give you about five minutes to do this. And then I want to come back and hear your response. And you'll work in the same group, I think, that you were just in since, since you were just there. So. Um, I'll see you in about five minutes.
Hello. Should I just wait uh, to come back? Uh, uh, were, are, were you not in a group? No. Uh, I will assign you to a group then. Oh, okay, thank you. There you go. Everyone's still brainstorming. That's great. Here we come back. Hello. Hello. So uh, we're, we're just about uh, out of time, and I would love to see any questions that you have in the chat. Um, before I ask for responses, uh, just a couple of things to point out um, is that when we're doing this kind of drama, and we were talking about process verbs earlier in re regards to the standards, this is really what we're working on a form of. of what's called process drama, wherein it is the activity and the conversations and the doing and the embodiment, which is the important experience rather than the experience of performance. <laughs> both are valid, both are equally supported in the standards, um, both process drama and performative drama. But when we're doing, especially this social justice work and work for social justice, it is the process, it's the conversations, it's the feelings that come up as we are embodying 
all of these emotions and thoughts that are what is important. And I hope that that was reflected in some of the conversations you were starting to have as you were uh, playing with the idea of image theater. Um, I would love to hear any thoughts or comments or responses to the experience of thinking about putting those images together, the image of the real, the image of the ideal, and the image of transition. Just go ahead and either raise a hand or popcorn in. I really like this to think about um, um, to help students think through really local problems, like maybe disagreements in the classroom. Um, you know, because I, I work mostly with with younger kids and, you know, like how to solve problems within the classroom. This might be a good problem solving tool. That, uh, that's, a, that's a great observation is that you absolutely can use this to what's it like on the playground now? What do you want it to be? And how do we transition to make it so? Um, in the handout, there are some references to um, how, how you can use it that way to, to resolve problems, issues in a school. Any other thoughts about this before we, before we end up? Um, for like our group, we talked about the pandemic and how um, it can make you feel isolated. And so if your students do an activity like this, in a sense, you're talking about isolation, but also feeling connected through that, you know, you can feel kind of, okay, these are the feelings, this is what it, you know, is represented by. And um, even though they might feel alone through it, they're not, they're alone together. Does that make sense? So they're like kind of connected and it can um, give them a greater understanding. Okay, you know, I'm not alone in this. And, and don't forget that you should have fun in doing this, um, that there should be an element in play and non-judgment in all of this, because that is an important way to, to help students reconnect once they are with each other in person. Um, is that if we keep it playful, if we keep it at the level of a game, um, it's much easier for them to, to reconnect. And, and this, the, the sense of using the body to express embodying emotions. You know, we've all been disembodied as we're all little faces on screens. And we need to find our way to be re-embodied as we're back in real rooms with each other. So that's, that's my, my portion. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, Jody, Nadja, um, Maureen, anything to add before we wind up for the day here? I would just like to ask everyone if they would please post in the chat something that they took away from this uh, webinar. What is the thing that they will hold on to? And then that way we can learn. But the, what's, the, what's the thing? It's a waterfall, right? Is everybody go in and type it right now, but don't post it. So type what it is that you learned in the chat. And then I'll give you a cue. And they'll all come cascading in together into the chat like a waterfall. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and hit the post button. Love that. Yeah, it's a great way to get everybody on there together. Go back and look at it. Mm -hmm.
Anything else from my, my, my colleagues? No, I think I, I learned a lot. I really enjoyed collaborating. I like, th there are a couple comments in here talking about, you know, it, you can incorporate art. And that's, I think the, the biggest takeaway is that it is so important. Art is so important. And if we can include that in our classes and our edu, you know, as educators and incorporate that and, and share those experiences with our students, they in turn will be more likely to look for it outside of the classroom, seek it. Um, it's a great way to make connections with your students um, and learn about them and build up those assets, those personal community and cultural assets. And, and, um, and don't forget that they, and we all have bodies and we've just been seeing these flat two-dimensional representations. Absolutely. And just to pause around some great local art, um, Kara Walker's from Stockton, you know, and we just have to go back to seeing who we have. Wayne Tebow, another great local artist. So looking at people of color who are around us that create works of art, um, you know, for all of us, we live in California, one of the greatest, you know, states for entertainment right? Looking to our local people. We don't have to go, as Maureen said, to that Western canon in France or Italy. Granted, I'm not dismissing that by any means, but a way to get kids excited and started is with folks that are nearby them and images that they see sometimes on a daily basis, especially if it's local public art. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone. Um, oh, one last question, uh, Eric. Yes. What were the two rules of improv? Make each other look good. Make your uh, partner look good was one. Make, that's the golden rule. Um, make your partner look good. And everything your partner says is true. Sometimes called the yes principle. Always, always respond with a yes. I love it. Very cool. Some of the stuff to take day to day in life. I yes. know it's like I'm going to apply that to just today. <laughs> I'm using the yes principle today. Yes. And yes, it's another <laughs> game we could play. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I hope Thank you all you. have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Nadia. Bye. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. Do we need a debrief?